last time I was here, it was writers with drunks, I mean writers with uh, drinks, excuse me, uh, and it was a disaster. And it was partly because I forgot half my pages, but it was also partly because I couldn't read the pages I brought because of uh, the lights. Uh, so this time, I came prepared. So I'd like to read a, a little excerpt from a memoir I'm working on called Road Trip. And um, uh, this part of it is about being 19, deciding I was going to leave my home in Portland, Oregon with $5 in my pocket and see if I could get across the country and uh, thereby prove that the universe was essentially good. And also, since uh, I was only outwardly 19, but inwardly uh, maybe 12 or 11. <laughs> Uh, I thought this would toughen me up, turn me into a man. <laughs> I got halfway across Canada, and uh, you know when you're hitching on a, a big road like that, uh, there's a lot of people hitching, and you kind of join up with people, and then they drop out, and different uh, little groups conglomerate. And uh, so at this point, I'm, I'm sort of hitching along with a guy named Robert, and we came to the city of Regina. I don't know how it's spelled but, uh, or how it's pronounced, but Regina, Regina, I don't know. Um, so we get to the other side of it, and that's where you hitch to go further east. And as far as the eye could see, like two miles right to the horizon, there were little clumps of hitchhikers. And, uh, you know, the new guys had to go to the end of the line because you weren't going to set up in front of 500 other hitchhikers. And this looked impossible. So Robert and I said, well, you know, uh, he had a map and we said, what's this little road that goes snaking up north and then comes back and joins the highway 200 miles later? Let's take that because uh, no one's hitchhiking there. So we went there and we stuck out our thumbs and instantly we got a ride. Um, and um, so it went four hours and then the guy was heading further north. He dropped us in a town called Yorkton, which was as far as you could get from the highway before you were headed back to the highway. A few ticks past midnight, we reached Yorkton. This was uh, 1969, incidentally. Our ride dropped us off and drove away. We looked around. Behind us loomed the forest. Ahead of us, a darkness crowded with the dim shapes of unlit houses. I counted two pedestrians in the entire scene, but that included Robert and me. It was too cold to contemplate sleeping in outdoors. We were quite far north, and it was past midnight. Robert at least had a backpack and a jacket. I had nothing but my faith in the essential goodness of the universe. Books and movies show vagabonds like us sleeping in barns, but we were not in farm country. Here in Yorkton, we would have to break into someone's garage, which would push us across a line from romantic vagabonds to petty criminals. We have to get indoors, I said. Frankly, I was getting a little frightened. We have to find some warm place to get a little shut up, man. We'll find some heads, Robert suggested. By heads, he didn't mean bathrooms. Back then, heads was the slang word for drug ingesting young people in the know. I guess young people always have a sense of solidarity vis-a-vis -vis their elders, but I wonder if there was ever a time when the young felt quite such cultish solidarity as we did in the 60s, at least those of us who were in the movement. Not that movement is the right term. There never really was an adequate term for the whole 60s cult. Back then, we knew who we were. Later, we discovered that some of us weren't one of us. <laughs> Later, we discovered there was no us. But in 1969, the dream was still alive, just peaking, in fact. The notion that secret knowledge existed and some folks had broken through to it. Certain signs marked these cognizanti. Long hair, bell bottoms, certain kinds of boots, which incidentally I was wearing. <laughs> knowledge of rock and roll was part of it too, in opposing the war in Vietnam, and understanding that Mao was cool, and that blacks were oppressed, and that American history was a sham, and that President Lyndon Johnson was a stupid idiot. These were exhilarating insights shared in a conspiratorial fashion among an elite minority of millions. 
<laughs> and among this minority, the burgeoning subset who had taken LSD were heads. I was a head. I had broken through at Carleton, my first college. I bought some LSD from another student, got myself an experienced guide, named with hell because he later won a seat in some state's legislature. Probably as the Get Tough on Drugs candidate. And after that, I knew just what Jimi Hendrix meant when he sang, Are You Experienced? Robert had taken LSD at a Ken Kesey acid test and later dropped some with members of the Grateful Dead, or so he claimed. <laughs> Heads were like brothers and sisters in some super Masonic organization. If we found some heads up here, we would have a place to crash. But what were the chances, really? I had to scoff at Robert. Yorkton, Canada, man, 100 miles north of, however it's pronounced, Regina, Regina? <laughs> Where are we going to find any heads here? In a laundromat, he said. <laughs> a laundromat? Trust me, he said. If there are any heads here, we'll find them in a laundromat. <laughs> Why a laundromat? Because they're open all night and you can hang in them for free. Heads, you see, did not hang out in bars. Acid was at one end of a continuum, alcohol at the other. Acid heads despised drunks. What we did, we called getting high. What they did, getting low. Still, I could offer no alternative, so we started working our way through town looking for a laundromat. The curves, I noticed, were about two feet high, about like that, making the streets look like dry canals. Robert noticed this too, and we puzzled over it as we climbed laboriously up from the street to the sidewalks. What did people in wheelchairs do around here? How did old ladies cross the streets? These high curves showed the ignorance of city planners up here in primitive Canada. <laughs> then it began to rain. Just a few fat drops at first, but enough to make me say, oh my God, we better get some shelter quick. We'll be okay once we find a laundromat. <laughs> Just at that moment, the rain started coming down in sheets an instantaneous transition from plickety-plate to roar. We took off like frightened cats, looking for a doorway, an awning, anything, running blind until we came to a curb. Whoa! We stopped dead. Where a street had been, a river now flowed. Did I say flowed? Wrong word. Rage was more like it. This way, cried Robert, sprinting for the next corner, as if the water would be lower there. I followed him, but of course came only to the banks of another torrent. So we headed for the third corner, <laughs> utterly drenched now, shielding our faces from the storm, while sudden rivers roared in the darkness all around us. And then, as if someone had just turned off a spigot, the rain stopped. Within minutes, the night turned uh, warm and pleasant. We remained as wet as creatures drenched from a lake, however, and we could not get to any shelter now, because the downpour had turned our entire block into an island. Wretchedly, we slumped around the fourth and final corner, and there, Mirabil Diktu, we saw a laundromat. <laughs> no mistaking those open doors, that neon glare. We staggered inside, and good heavens, five or six guys about our age were lounging about on the washing machines. Guys with long hair. <laughs> We had found the heads of Yorkton. <laughs> My admiration for Robert skyrocketed. <laughs> Locating heads in this backwater took a level of street craft I could only dream of acquiring. <laughs> we didn't have to present any credentials. Heads didn't have to prove their bona fides to each other. It was enough to appear in the dead of night looking as we did and have long hair. They knew what we were, we knew what they were, and suddenly, life was good. Oh man, are we glad to see you. We just blew in from the coast, I said. You guys know of any place to crash? The coast, they exclaimed in wonder. You been in Frisco? <laughs> just came from there, said Robert. After a stop in Vancouver, I was in tight with the gypsy jokers there. He took acid with the Grateful Dead, I added. Hey, we 
took some Owsley once, said one of these Canadian boys. Owsley was a famous maker of LSD, part of the crowd that hung around with Ken Kesey and the dead. Here in Yorkton, Canada, the mere fact that we were, quote, blowing in from the coast made us superstars. These fellows didn't merely want to help us, they wanted to impress us. I took some purple haze one time, another of them bragged. Robert sat down to discuss the various brand names of acid with these boys. Sunshine, Purple Haze, Jack-O-Lantern, Owsley, Blue Streak. Then the talk turned to all the different forms in which, in which LSD was dispensed. The locals wanted our wisdom. Which was better, water acid or tab acid? Robert's, Robert discussed the virtues of each, discoursed on dangers of dividing a pill, explained some techniques for heightening the effects once they started. And of course, each of us had to brag about a time when we took way too much acid that was way too strong. But I did not add much to the discussion. I was dead on my feet. We've been you know, hitching for like a week now. I wanted a bed and a pillow. If these guys knew the crash pad, I wanted them to take us to it right now. They said we should talk to Jack. He'd come by later. Then they went back to discussing different brands of acid. I tried to hint that we weren't choosing. Anyone's crash pad would do. Could we please just go to some place, any place? But I couldn't hurry them. No, they insisted only Jack's pad was cool enough for guys like us. Heads from the coast, radical dudes who knew the dead by name and hung out with gypsy jokers. They were not worthy. We didn't have to stoop. Jack would come by soon. Oh, we dig Jack, he assured, they assured us. Jack was on our level. He'd taken enough acid to explode a horse. <laughs> Two tabs of Owsley back to back one time. He'd even hitched to, there's that city again, Regina, Regina. <laughs> He'd even hitched there once to see the cream play live. Can't you call Jack, I ventured. But no, Jack didn't like to be called. Jack would show up when Jack showed up. He was that kind of guy. He'll be here. <laughs> Gradually it dawned on me that these fellows were younger than we assumed. They weren't heads, they were high school students. <laughs> they all lived with their parents. No way would they be taking two raggedy, real-life, acid-gobbling heads from the coast home with them. We'd have to wait for Jack, who was probably their slightly older friend, probably the only one who had a place of his own. Finally, I lost patience and stalked outside to get a breath of air. And there in the middle of nowhere, Canada, Sometime past midnight, out of the deserted night, came a big, bluff, red-faced, hearty, jolly, glad-handing, middle-aged man in a quality trench coat over an expensive suit. He came striding right up to me, thrust out his hand, and boomed, Mackenzie, Harold Mackenzie, how you doing? How you doing? My guard went up. My radar locked into the on position. I was instantly thinking pederast or cop or the wrong kind of drug dealer. <laughs> But Mr. Trenchcoat wasted no time explaining why he wanted my friendship. He had just busted out of a maximum security wedding party that his wife had insisted he attend. He never wanted to go in the first place, see? And now he and she had gotten into a big fight, not his fault, and he wanted to buy me a drink and tell me all about it. I'm with friends, I pointed toward the laundromat. Bring them along, I'll buy you all a drink, come on. By drink he meant coffee. The waters had receded by this time, and we were able to wade across the street. So a trench coat led all seven of us to an all-night diner and bought each of us a cup of coffee so weak it would have been safe for a baby to drink. Then commenced to tell us the particulars of his quarrel with his wife. He was, it turned out, an open-handed, open-hearted, bombastically cheerful good guy with no ulterior motives. He only wanted someone to hear him out and agree that he was right. We listened and nodded as he sat with his back to the door and held forth, his big face shining down upon us with the florid warmth of an aging sun, a red giant. For the price of a cup of coffee, we gave him all the sympathy he could absorb, and he walked away satisfied. I never saw him again, but thanks to the cup of coffee he had bought us, Robert and I were now entitled to sit in this booth all night, because that was the rule at an all-night diner. If you buy something, you can stay as long as you want. 
And if the thing you bought was coffee, you could help yourself to unlimited refills.